Hello again from Checkmate Humanity. Please like, subscribe, share this video, and set notifications all so you know when I've uploaded my next video. Today I have some beep, 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 beep breaking news in the case of the two YouTubers I covered a couple weeks ago. Last night during a live broadcast in the true crime community, a journalist joined the chat and dropped some pretty big bombshells. And I'll link to the video below, but I'm also going to highlight the bombshells here just after giving you a brief reminder about the case. This is a case that involves a plaintiff getting a permanent restraining order against a defendant. And both parties are true crime YouTubers. One is unmasked and the other is truth and transparency. The permanent restraining order was put into effect on March 7th after a lengthy, somewhat circus-like hearing. I'll also link to my previous video about this to give you a reminder of where that stands. I want to acknowledge that I do have a bias in this situation, but my feelings and my bias are not as important as getting the information out that in a context of understanding what's actually happening. So since the time that uh, she was served this permanent restraining order, the defendant has announced that she's filed appeal paper paperwork and that she's retained lawyers to represent her in Colorado. She represented herself in the, in the last hearing. She's also done, done a number of live streams since the order was put into place that appear, in my opinion, to break the terms of the order, but that's, again, not for me to judge. We do know that both parties are under a gag order, especially the defendant, because the permanent res protection order is on her. And it also needs to be remembered that most of her behavior was seen conducted on YouTube using the YouTube platform, using YouTube's tools. In addition, one of the witnesses that I told you about, who's a friend of the defendant and attempted to serve papers on the plaintiff on behalf of the defendant the day before the hearing, and appeared to have lied on the stand for the defendant or to just cover up basically what whatever they were up to. She has now made a series of videos in defense of herself and also in defense of truth and transparency. I'll also link to her channel so you can see her remarks for yourself and, you know, m draw your own conclusions. But last night, something honestly remarkable happened that... Um, shocked me as a former public relations executive who spent many, many, many years dealing with major news organizations. During this live stream on a channel called Aunt Lala, a journalist who comes in under the account name Beaver Countian, but is associated with CBS's 48 Hours and multiple other new national news organizations, came in and revealed that not only has a team of journalists been investigating the situation around truth and transparency for nearly a year or something like that, I'll go through the messages, but also confirmed that she's under criminal investigation in three different states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Colorado. He also said that he's looking for more information. So I'm going to walk you through his messages right now and give you my professional interpretation of how to put these messages in the chat room in perspective. Okay, so I just want to be clear that I am going through these screenshots in a video that has been produced by the creator called Sister Knives. Um, she apparently captured all of these um, messages that were put into the chat, um, last night. Um, and I'm not sure why, but the chat from last night has been disabled. So I can't go through the actual video where it all happened. So I'm using this video from sister knives to, to show you because I believe she captured it all. But anyway, so first of all, right here, it says, from the Beaver County, and again, this is somebody who has um, ties to a lot of national news organizations as well, says, allow me to help you understand the current situation. Ms. Oriani's conspiracy theories are false. Her accusations against witnesses and in homicide investigations are untrue, harassing, and dangerous. For a member of the news media to say those things... He has to, and this is just based on my experience, he has to know that those things are true and know how they're going to be received within the community. Um, he had to have a great deal of um, 
oversight before he was able to come out publicly on a public forum and say that she's a conspiracy theorist, that her accusations against witnesses are false and also untrue, harassing, and dangerous. Okay, and here it says, Today, Ms. Oriani tagged CBS 48 Hours, CBS Pittsburgh, and a local newspaper. These news organizations are aware of Miss Oriani, and he meant to say Oriani, I think, and have independently come to the same conclusion, the woman is crazy. So what he's basically saying is that when, when people when, like Truth and Transparency tag news organizations, they have teams of people that are paying attention to all these tags and paying attention to the quality of what these tags are saying and trying to figure out, should I pay attention to this? Is this something that's important enough for me to follow up on? And what they're basically saying is that we've seen these tags and based on all of these tags, or at least these news organizations are aware of Miss Oriani and have independently come to the same conclusion, the woman is crazy. So again, highly unusual and but not unethical in my view for someone to start coming out and reporting on these things when um, clearly it's an important matter to be to be talked about next thing he says is oriani banned me after i revealed her claims that sheldon jeter and this is sheldon jeter jr is a case that truth and transparency has been working on from her channel and also is representing with her nonprofit fight for a family and it says here, Oriani banned me after I revealed her claims that Sheldon Jeter Jr. had been cleared of murdered of murder by the district attorney were false. So he was basically telling her in her own chat on her channel. I don't know if it was in comments or in chat, but he was telling her what you said is false. Sheldon Jeter Jr. is not cleared of murder in the eyes of the D.A., so it's false to report that. And as a result of saying that, and he wasn't saying it in a rude way, unless it's different than what he's been, you know, how he's coming across here. Um, he was banned for having that opinion. So then he next say, says, Mr. Jeter's mother has claimed to be in an intense sexual relationship with Ms. Oriani, although Ms. Oriani has denied such. So, that is a pretty explosive claim that this person, Truth and Transparency, has gotten into a allegedly sexual relationship with basically her client or her client's mother. Um, and in my opinion, is not becoming or ethical for a person who runs a nonprofit advocating for victims to enter in that kind of a relationship with somebody that she's trying to help. Now here he says, my understanding is that Ohio law prohibits a board of nonprofit to be comprised of a married couple when that couple comprises the majority of the board. And what he's talking about here is that fight for a family is comprised currently, at least as far as we know of three board members. One is Lana Oriani, and two, the other two are the parents of Christopher Watts, Ronnie and Cindy Watts. And what the Beaver Countian is saying here is that Ohio, Ohio law prohibits that. So um, it just puts into question the, the ethical practices of the nonprofit. And it, he wouldn't be say, I, I I'm telling you that a person who is affiliated with um, news organizations who take their fact checking very seriously comes from a much more informed place than we do on YouTube about this type of stuff. He didn't just all of a sudden one day go, ah, I think I'll just start typing in a chat. It was actually done because he's trying to get information out about what's happening in this case and also offering to, um, to take information that may either bolster or I'm sure he's 
I can't speak for this person, but I know that journalists are willing to look at both sides of the story. So if you have information to refute and prove that what he is saying is wrong, then he wants to hear from you. You have that right as well. So here he says, Ms. Oriani has been desperately seeking national media attention. My team and I have been recording and transcribing her antics since last year and have thousands of pages of information compiled to date. Now that may seem, you know, whatever to, to, to most people, but to me, I was like floored to actually see that there is actually a team of investigators on a, on the journalistic side documenting all of this stuff so that they can be correct in their reporting as well. Uh, the amount of resources, time, money, uh, you know, these people are compensated very highly. So time is money for them and time is a lot of money for them. For So for them to say that they've been you know, on this case for that long a period of time is remarkable. So here he says, this is another thing. <laughs> I have spoken to the county district attorney who informed me that under state law, private investigators must be licensed in the state and Ms. Oriani is not licensed and is not qualified to be. So I, I talked about this in my previous video that um, Ms. Oriani has... Um, basically con considers herself a wonderful private investigator, but um, it appears that you need to have a license to do that legally. And she doesn't, and she's not qualified to have that license. But this takes that information a step further in confirming that he actually talked to the district attorney to get confirmation of that to the point where the district attorney is okay with him saying, I talked to the district attorney. So he, this reporters can't go out and represent what public officials say or what anybody says without it being okay, without them saying that this is, um, you can say that I said that. It's important to them. And then he says here, FYI, under Ohio law, nonprofits cannot file litigation pro se. And that's what, what he's saying there is that they have looked at the facts of what Ohio law states. She's running a nonprofit, but she's also uh, representing herself pro se. And she says that her nonprofit fight for a family is representing her in her own case. And what he's saying here is under Ohio law that that's not lawful. And he had to confirm that. So, this is one of the messages that made me, that really made me stop in my tracks and say, this information is important to get out to the community. All right. We have spoken with high level law enforcement officials who revealed Ms. Oriani is under investigation in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Colorado. State police received complaints about Ms. Oriani. All right. So for him to actually come out and say that he had to get the permission of the people. And I, and again, this is based on my experience. I know how this works. A person on that side of the journalism table cannot come out and say that they've spoken with high level law enforcement officials and that they on the record are confirming that she is under investigation in those three States. And, and it also speaks to the gravity of this situation that three different states are, have her under criminal investigation. Oh, and this is another one. Wow. Okay. We have B-roll of Ms. Oriani outside of the Broomfield court. So what they're, again, this is the immense resources that are being put into this investigation. They knew that the hearing was taking place on March 7th and they dispatched a crew to take camera B-roll to take high definition footage of the people walking out of the courthouse after the, before, after, I don't know, whatever the hearing took place. 
that is when I knew that they were super serious because it it takes a lot for them to put together a budget to send out a crew um, from a whole other state. They didn't. I, I don't. I doubt that they flew there. They were probably from a local news organization in Colorado. But for them to be dispatched there to take time to do that um, is important. And I wonder if anybody there saw those camera crews, uh, anybody from the parties in the court. But here's another one. Here he says, producers for national publications are involved in the analyzing of information being collected about Oriani's faults, conspiracy theories involving innocent witnesses in homicide cases. Phew. That's a... <laughs> producers for national publications are involved in the analyzing. You guys, I... I hope I'm not v being redundant here, but that it is a big deal for somebody to come and say that in a chat for a new a n national news journalist to come and say that in a chat, they wanted this information out there. In my opinion, they wanted this information out there because they are getting ready to something's getting ready to happen. They choose when they do these things. And here's another one. I have a team of attorneys who have previously assisted us in setting state precedent in legal matters. I'm not as scared of Oriani Pro's indigent litigation. Reporting facts is not tortious behavior. So basically what he's saying is that all these things I'm saying here have been vetted by attorneys. So if somebody is worried about what we're saying here, um, go ahead, let me know. But also... In my view, this if this this story gets covered by national news, um, it will help set a precedent for how these things are unraveling online, on social media and in YouTube, and show why there needs to be stronger um, mechanisms in place to moderate situations between YouTubers. And then someone was asking, a, a, an account was saying, earlier in the chat was saying something like, are you looking into, or maybe you could talk to her mods or are you, you look, are you looking into her mods? And then, and then the Beaver County and says, our assessment is that many of these mods are part of a harem of sycophants whose devotion to her faults and illegal conspiracy theories bolster Ms. Oriani's narcissistic rantings. I'll just let you, take that for what it is. And there were a couple, couple other messages exchanged as everyone was exiting, but um, it was just a little bit of light banter between. As I said earlier, I've been dealing with the media for many years. This, this means I interfaced with the media on behalf of large and small companies. And I also spent six months in the San Francisco Bureau of the Wall Street Journal and spent a good portion of that working alongside their journalists to understand how to view the truckloads of information that comes in to determine what's important enough to actually publish in the paper. And before anything gets actually published in the paper, it gets peer reviewed throughout the entire news organization. Legal people look at it. They have to make sure their sources are checked and that they're valid and that they have proof. That is the strenuous process that they go through before they put anything in their paper. And I can tell you this, it's highly, highly unusual for national news journalists to appear in the chat of a YouTuber to expose this information in that way, to let them know that they're working on. And the reason it's highly unusual is because new news organizations that investigate a story for this long, they don't want to tip off their competitors to what they're working on. So it doesn't get covered from beneath their feet. In other words, they don't want to get scooped, right? For him to be able to say the things he said in a public chat, where the people most affected by the situation are likely going to see it, he likely had to have the permission of multiple people, even the legal team internally, to and people far above his pay grade. They probably gave him permission to do that because they have nearly completed their investigation and are looking to fill in some gaps in their story before they hit the publish button. So I encourage anyone who's been affected by truth and transparency or you know, other situations on YouTube that are just as, you know, troubling and uh, remarkable, 
this is not just about the situation with truth and transparency. It's also about YouTube's handling of the situation. In my view, that's how I see things. So, um, I'll put the emails, the email address he gave in the description below. And I know it's a scary prospect to contact a national news jur journalist, but I can tell you from my own years of experience that when you work with serious journalists on this level, they take confidentiality as like a life and death situation. So they're in the business of knowing how to protect their sources and not put them in any more danger than necessary. It is possible to talk to these journalists off the record or on background if you decide that you want to, you don't want to reveal yourself. Or if you decide you do want to reveal yourself, you can give them permission to use your name. But that's totally within your control. With all that said, thanks for being here and peace out.